Okay, I'm going to talk um, about the future of TESOL, and specifically I'm going to try and answer the question, do we still need native English speaker teachers? That's NESTS and ESTS. Um, I'm going to um, have a go at this in, in three parts. So this particular part um, is called um, Losing Brand Exclusivity. Um, and um, the other um, uh, parts I'm going to look at uh, is this in the second lecture is about ELF. Do you speak ELF English as a lingua franca? And in the third part of the lecture, um, a third lecture, I'm going to look at um, the call revolution and um, the new um, projected ideas about um, digitized conversation partners. But uh, in this lecture, I'm going to talk about losing brand exclusivity. Okay, so uh, let's start off with some recent information. This 2012, I believe, 2011-2012, uh, and this is uh, information you can find in a document called Open Doors, and it's about um, the yearly trends in international students and American students studying abroad. Um, what you can see, and this reflects what we can see about us um, on any American campus, is that there's an increasing number of international students. And this, as you can see, that, that number is getting to the 800,000 mark, okay? And um, it actually is 764,495. And that's about a 5.7% increase on uh, last year's numbers of international students. Um, where do they come from? Well, the leading countries are China and India, although India has uh, suffered a certain amount of loss. As you can see, um, Saudi Arabia has uh, made huge, great increases. Um, this partly reflects... Um, regaining the position Saudi Arabia had in with regard to international students that they kind of lost in the post 9-11 uh, period. Um, uh, notice also um, traditional sources for um, international students such as um, um, South Korea, um, Taiwan, Japan uh, have been suffering a, a loss, a decline, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. And as you go down there, you can also notice some interesting um, uh, phenomena. Iran, uh, surprisingly, has had a major increase. What are they studying? Um, well, um, uh, traditionally, if you look at the graduate um, um, students, um, uh, international students were mainly made up of graduate students. Um, but if you look in the last three or four years, what you'll see is a decline in the growth of graduate students uh, compared with undergraduate students, which has certainly um, um, developed uh, a great deal. Um, but contrast that with uh, non-degree students and we have a whopping 17 percent increase there really is a connection between the non-degree students and the increase in undergrad students whereas graduate students arrive in american universities usually without need of much english preparation those undergrad students really require often up to a year of preparation in bridge classes to get into a mainstream undergraduate program so that's kind of what those figures are telling you. Um, and you can see this a little clearly if we look at the fields they're going into. Um, um, business, management, engineering, uh, math and computer sciences are the ones that claim most of the students. Um, but you'll also see um, uh, a figure there for intensive English and that intensive English, as I said, is usually uh, a bridge to the mainstream uh, undergraduate uh, programs. Okay, um, 
what I'd said was that it appeared as if, or it does appear as if, um, the number of international students is increasing, and that's true. But let's take another look at this and look at the proportionate number of international students to, to uh, American students. And if you look at 2000, 2001, you'll see that international students are constituted 3.6% of the total student body of um, 15 million. If you look at 10 years later, 2011, 2012, what you'll see is that particular figure has barely gone up. It's gone to 3.7. In fact, if you look at previous years, it actually had gone down. So what we're seeing is um, not, a, not an increase in the number of international students uh, proportionately in American universities, but an actual constant. Uh, what has increased in American universities just as much is the, the number of American students attending university. Okay, so with that in mind, uh, I want to just go through a few trends in um, TESOL. Uh, and this is really based upon uh, Gradol's survey of 2006. And Gradol, was, that was his second survey. He did one in the 1990s. And so every 10 years or so, Gradol seems to come out with a, a survey, a very important survey of TESOL trends. So let me go through some of these um, trends suggested by Gradal. Um, firstly, and um, this is just to reiterate what I've just said there, the proportionate number of students studying abroad in English-speaking countries is actually decreasing. What we saw with the United States was the proportionate number was kind of holding steady, but there'd been no really major increase. Uh, if we take a global figure, what we're finding, and if we compare that to students who stay home to study English, then what we're actually seeing is a decrease. Okay, the raw numbers have gone up, but the proportionate numbers have actually decreased. A second trend, of course, is that, um, that our um, English learners are increasing in um, in numbers, as we've see, said, we certainly there are more and more English learners. They're learning at home, and also they're um, they're learning at much earlier ages. So think of the, the fashion in places like Hong Kong and Shanghai uh, to have pre-K uh, English lessons, and there's plenty of jobs for uh, language teachers teaching um, three and four year olds. Uh, next trend is that um, non-native speaker providers of English language um, um, teaching services in Europe and Asia will, in will create major competition for native speaker countries. So what does that mean? What that means is that in Europe and in Asia we've seen the rise of universities who use English as the language of instruction. And here's a good example. Um, Central European University, uh, based in uh, Budapest. Um, they run uh, master's programs, and they're all taught in English. And they get students from all oh, many different parts of the world to go there and study in English. But it's not an English-speaking society. Um, next trend is that the English which learners are increasing, increasingly learning and if you think of Central um, um, European University, uh, is a form of global English. It's not the traditional variety of native speaker English. It's not American English, it's not British English, it's not Australian English. It is a global English. And I'll go on later to describe that in terms of ELF, ELF, English as a lingua franca. Uh, the next trend is that we're going to be experienced, we haven't yet experienced this, a real call, computer-assisted language learning revolution. 
uh, in the form of digitized conversation partners. That is, we'll be speaking to robots, and robots, robots will be speaking back to us. Yeah, we've already got Siri, but Siri's pretty dumb compared with what's coming. I'm going to talk about that in the third lecture. Um, next trend is that um, countries like China and India will be major, major players in global English. So the, perhaps the influences on the development of a global, of global English will come from places like India and China because of their vast population. And their effect on the language will be profound. Uh, which all leads us to what we have to uh, accept is that the native English speaker teacher is becoming increasingly irrelevant. Yeah, there are still jobs for you, so don't get too worried, but the trend is non-native speaker teachers are going to be far more important than native English speaker teachers. Um, that all, what that means, uh, putting in another way and making an analogy, right, is that um, the native English speaker teacher is losing brand exclusivity. So if you think of um, uh, vodka, and you probably think of Russian or Polish or maybe Scandinavian uh, vodka, but what we've seen in the last 10 years is that many, many countries throughout the world produce vodka. In fact, uh, Grey Goose, which is French uh, vodka, uh, is one of the um, uh, uh, biggest selling vodkas in the world. Uh, what we know is that many other countries produce vodka, the USA and Canada, of course, the Caribbean, Australia, and even Japan. Um, so the native English speaker teacher is like the Russian vodka. Okay, It's not as exclusive. We don't think, oh, it has to be Russian vodka. Oh no, because there's lots of other great vodkas out there. So your native English speaker teacher is losing that particular brand exclusivity. Um, let me just um, uh, revisit a few of those um, trends and, and talk about them a little bit more. Um, if we think of the American universities, um, uh, what they're doing is competing for international students and they're increasingly uh, losing out in that particular competition even though it seems as though the raw numbers are increasing. Um, so if we think of those universities like um, the Central European University, we have this expansion of those particular places in source countries, and that's going to reduce the demand for uni university education in English-speaking countries. Why travel all the way to the United States and to a culture which may be difficult when you could go a shorter distance to a university in Shanghai, Hong Kong, Singapore, or Budapest? Um, Source countries that exported students are now importing students. Okay, So remember those um, uh, figures at the beginning. What we found was that um, uh, recently the number of students from Korea, uh, Japan, um, Thailand, um, uh, and Indian students um, are, are actually going, more of those are going to Chinese universities. So that's reflecting the greater economic power, the rising economic power of China, and the way that attracts international students. And um, our, so what we're seeing is um, these kind of hubs uh, and English-speaking higher education hubs in places like Malaysia, Singapore, and as we've said, um, um, uh, like Central U uh, European uh, University in uh, Budapest, and of course many in Germany. Um, let me try and capture that um, uh, illusion of the fact that we have so many Chinese students in American universities. Um, if we take a figure, and I, it, this is a, a ballpark figure, let's say there's about 300,000 Chinese students studying English in some part of the world. 
Um, there's about 200,000 in the United States, and let's say 100,000 elsewhere. There are actually about 400,000 um, Chinese students studying abroad, but they're not all, st all studying in English, of course. Um, that represents more or less the 300,000 figure, about 0.1% of all students studying English in China. So, put that another way, 99.9% .9 of Chinese students learning English in China study with a non-native English speaker te uh, teacher. Okay, So, if you think of that, vast number of students, nests could never supply that kind of demand. What we're seeing then is a rise in the number of students studying English in their home countries and therefore a rise in the number of non-native English-speaking teachers. So, um, what we can say is there's uh, a, a lessening of the demand for native English speaker teachers. Um, the other element, which I'll go on to talk about in the next lecture, is an increasing English, uh, interest in world Englishes, uh, in EIL, English as an international language, and ELF, English as a lingua franca. Native English speaker teachers do not necessarily know much about world Englishes, about Indian English, about Chinese English, or Singaporean English, or in English as an international language, or probably less so about English as a lingua franca. At the same time, we're getting an increasing respect for non-native English speaker teachers, and that's accompanied by less blind adoration of the blonde-haired, blue-eyed, stereotypical notion of the native English speaking teacher. Um, let me just um, um, use some anecdotal evidence here, and this is taken from a blog, but I think it kind of captures some of the kind of feelings about native English speaker teachers, and this particular blog is written from the perspective of someone studying English in China. So I'm just going to um, read a, 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 about a page from this, a couple of pages from this blog. So I'm a Chinese, I'm uh, a Chinese, I am a Chinese, oh okay, that, <laughs> not that completely fluent then, and I am bilingual and presently in China. Uh, many Western teachers in China are, insist, are sincerely trying their best and doing a good job in teaching English. But there are also many unqualified ones coming over to teach in China who do not even have proper training in teaching or a major in English or education. They may speak and use the language well, but they do not know how to teach to the Chinese people as a second language. They do not even understand what Chinese language is and how the Chinese learn their mother tongue. If they cannot understand the vast linguistic differences and cultural differences between Chinese and English, how on earth would they be able to help the students handle the problems effectively? You have to know them, understand them, before you can teach them, right? I do not claim to know more English than you, but as long as I can communicate clearly and concisely my point to anyone in English, I think I've achieved my objective of learning English as a second language. And I did not take any lessons from any Western English teacher. All of my English teachers are Asian. In fact, there's nothing so special um, being able to use English. It's just another international language for us to communicate. Okay, um, maybe there's a lot of things we could disagree with there, but I think it's reflective of a particular viewpoint of, firstly, the kind of English that people are increasingly demanding, which is not American English, it's not British English, it's not a particular variety of English, but it's a global international English. And secondly, um, a greater respect uh, of the non-native English speaker teacher and a an assessment that perhaps native uh, uh, non-native English speaker teachers are more adapted to the particular problems of teaching English in a society like China. Okay, 
So, um, let's finish up then. Um, this is actually um, Ranald MacDonald, who has the um, claim to fame of, as being the first English teacher in Japan. He was actually um, shipwrecked, and at the time Japan was closed, so when he landed in Japan, he was put under arrest. Um, what he was uh, happened while he was uh, imprisoned, of course, he was seen as a particular language resource, and so he was used um, by the um, uh, translators, the interpreters, um, who needed to uh, learn English. Uh, they used him as a source, like a native informant. Um, he was really a native informant rather than an actual teacher, because he didn't really know anything about teaching. He was like all the people, many of the people who go to China now. Uh, who go as native speakers, but have little idea of methodology. Um, interestingly, he had a Scottish father and a Chinook mother, so um, I guess he's pretty bilingual. He was bilingual. Um, and he, um, he was taken to Nagasaki, um, and um, he was used by those particular interpreters to develop their English. Um, and one of his students, um, Inosuke uh, Moriyama, um, was a person who was there to meet Commodore Perry when Japan finally opened up to the rest of the world. So, um, there it is, in memoriam, native English speaker, teacher.